Sam Harris, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Asha. It's good to see you. It's great to speak to you. Um, so you've worked on, on, on so many important things over the years, uh, but I actually want to start by revisiting one of the topics that really made you uh, prominent. You were one of the uh, free horsemen of uh, atheism. Uh, four, in... four horsemen. Four, you've, sorry. You've removed a horseman, yes. Uh, you were one of the four horsemen of uh, yeah. of atheism. Um, I, I, I want to do two things. One is that I want to just hear the intellectual case for atheism. I mean, afterwards, I have some political questions for you. But just what is the intellectual case for atheism and, and why should we care about that? Well, the, the, the epistemological case for it is pretty simple. It's the same as the case for not believing in Zeus or Poseidon or Isis or any of the other of you know, the thousands of dead gods that um, uh, are interred in the in the graveyard we call mythology, right? So it's just the, the atheist, and this is a kind of a famous trope of atheism, the atheist just goes one god further and consigns the god of Abraham to the same fate, right? I mean, these are clearly inventions of people and they don't purport to be, right? The God of Abraham is explicit in the Bible and the Quran that, uh, you know, this is uh, the document you're now reading is is the, the, the word of God. This is not of human, of human manufacture. Um, and it's just obvious that that can't be so. I mean, it's, it's really a claim when you're dealing explicitly with Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, it's really a claim explicitly about books because these these traditions are based on claims about books, right? There's, they're based on revelation or what purports to be revelation. And yet you look at the books and there's just no way they're the product of omniscience. I mean, they, they betray their merely human origins on every page. And what they don't show, which would have been trivially easy for a God to put in there, is a single sentence that announces its its uh, supernatural provenance, right? I mean, just think of how easy it would be for an omniscient being to write a book or even a single page of text that proved that it could not be of human origin. I mean, that's just, it would be the first thing you would do uh, if you're trying to convince anyone of anything or even just be useful over, over the centuries. Uh, but rather than give us a um uh, you know insights into mathematics and science and you know computation and you know everything else that we care about at the moment medicine um it tells us how to sacrifice goats right and when precisely and you know and how to keep slaves and i mean it's just i'm not saying there's no wisdom in those books of course there are but there was wisdom you know in in many other books uh, in that period um so there's no monopoly on wisdom in the Bible, you know, at, at any of the stage of its, of, uh, of any, of the, any of the stages of its completion. And um, so let's just be honest about the nature of the books. And, and so, and the moment you are honest, you witness to your horror that we're living in a world that is shattered over competing claims about literature. Right. I mean, it's, the, the situation we're in is every bit as absurd as a world in which people would be seeking to pass laws infringing on the rights of their neighbors or to start wars or to commit terrorist atrocities based on rival interpretations of the plays of Shakespeare. Right now, well, we don't live in that world, but it, just imagine how absurd it would seem to live in that world. Right. You got these plays and you got the, you got the Hamlet cult that's going against the Lear cult. And they're literally willing to die and let their children die over differences of opinion about those, you know, various texts. It would be insane, but the world we live in is every bit as insane as all that, right? And yet we've acclimated to it. Uh, we we cease to notice it, right? It's no longer salient to most people, except most atheists. So that that atheism is, uh, you know, intellectually and and politically relevant in the end because it. It um, is the only lens you can throw up over the present that reveals how insane and obscene, really, the, the, the wastage of human life and opportunity and attention is over 
these ridiculous claims about texts, right? And that, that's now, I'm, I'm sure you'll get there, but what I'm not denying in all of that is that there are extraordinary experiences that are testified to in some of these books, right? And that, that the transformation of the human mind is possible and that, you know, unconditional love is possible and self-transcendence is possible and, so, and certain people have extraordinary charisma and all, like all of that is, is real as, you know, as, as phenomenology. Uh, and we should be interested in all that, but we should be investigating that and experiencing that and talking about it most of all in 21st century terms. So that's an excellent summary of the case for atheism. I wonder how far it goes though, right? So that feels like a strong set of arguments to be skeptical about uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, you know, various particular religious texts. It doesn't strike me as an argument for the absence of some divine force. So uh, mm -hmm. does the core of your atheism just say, um, you know, the main monotheistic religions uh, are wrong, we have no reason to believe in those? Or do you think that by extension, the same argument can be made about any particular set of claims, and we should therefore not believe in uh, any uh, purposive higher force? Uh, no, I mean, it really is limited to the claim, the obviously false claims about books, you know, the, especially the divine origin of certain books and the and the virgin birth of certain people, uh, et cetera. But no, I mean, I think I think there's every reason to believe that the universe is stranger than we realize and may, in fact, be stranger than we can realize. And, you know, so so if you're going to tell me we, we, we live in a universe where there are trillions upon trillions of nearly identical copy, copies of ourselves having precisely this conversation or or something close to this conversation. Um, you know, that's that picture of a multiverse. I and mean, that's as strange as anything you find in religion. And yet probably one third of physicists at the moment believe something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, but they have reasons for believing something like that, you know, as, as uh, unintuitive as it is. Um, so yeah, you know, and if we we're living in a simulation on some alien supercomputer, I mean, the, like the, the the world could be profoundly counterintuitive. Um, and so yeah, I'm not closing my accounts with with every strange version of of ontology. There, it's just uh, every specific claim has to be taken on its own merits, right? And if you're if you're saying, well, the, here's a book that is perfect in every syllable and you know it could not possibly have been written by mere mortals well then let's that's a very easy claim to analyze uh and there's no book that that survives you know contact with that with that claim um but and so but you know you know if you again you can just take take each of these claims as they come you know take the claims of l ron hubbard which you know, mark, mark the foundation of Scientology, right? Well, like, you know, we, we have this guy's driver's license, right? And we have his, you know, we know a lot about L. Ron Hubbard. And so that, the reason why Scientology looks more like a cult and less like a religion is not merely the number of subscribers. It's that, it, you know, it's all too human origins are well-documented, right? And, and Mormonism is right on the cusp of that, you know, invidious, uh, analysis and but as you go as you push back further into history um it becomes the, the scope for alleging miracles where we just don't have facts uh it, beca it becomes a little bit wider and that's what people have done but it's just um again i'm and i'm not even closing the the, the door to any possibility of 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 what we might call a miracle, right? I mean, a miracle on one level would just be some aspect of of natural law or or you know natural phenomenon that we don't understand. I mean, the universe is whatever it is, and there's no no one thinks we are anywhere near fully understanding it, right? So yeah, things could be very strange, in fact. But, it's but just, what about it's not strange in that way? So you know, I'm trying to play devil's advocate to some extent, or perhaps God's advocate, because I grew up as a non-religious person. My parents, my grandparents were not religious, and so um, I, I find it easy to agree with you on much of that. But 
Um, when we're talking about miracles, you know, what about the possibility of a miracle that goes beyond what you're saying, right? So one uh, understanding of miracle is simply there's clearly a lot of laws of nature that we haven't understood. And so there could be certain events uh, that just befuddle us. And one way of expressing that is to say, well, it's a kind of miracle, right? Um, you know, what about the possibility that there is some purposive divine force that intervenes in the affairs of the universe at certain points and that actually does have a capability in some meaningful sense of that term to suspend laws of nature, right? To intervene in the ordinary mm. course of things as a supernatural agent. Now, I have no particular uh, reason to believe that, but it strikes me that it's also really hard to come up with a reason to disbelieve that. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'm I'm wondering whether you're agnostic about those kinds of claims or whether you think we can uh, reject them in a uh, more universal in a in a more universal sense, not just as the, as regards particular claims made in particular human texts, um, uh, but even as regards possible such claims. Well, I would say there's no evidence for such claims, right? And and um, if there were such a force, right? If there were some kind of divine mind that could intervene in our affairs whenever it liked or he or she liked well then one thing you can know about this mind is that it's not moral in the sense that we would would want to claim right it's certainly not compassionate if if you're if the focus if the appropriate focus of compassion is human and animal suffering right it's not it's it, it wasn't of much help when 500 million people were killed by smallpox in the 20th century, right? It, was, it wasn't much help during the Holocaust, right? So you have all these religious people thanking God for these invisible interventions, right? You know, you get, you 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 find a parking space that just a second ago wasn't there and you thank God for for you know, easing your, your, you know, the various transitions in your day, you know, or more seriously, you, you know, you get a diagnosis of cancer, but, you know, you get this miraculous remission right? Your doctors thought you were doomed and you got better, right? Well, but think of all the people who didn't get better, right? And think of all the, the good work this God of yours has not done in the lives of others who are just as des deserving or even more deserving of compassion than you were. I mean, just think of all the children who cannot be accused of having done anything wrong who are annihilated casually moments after birth or, you know, in, in the first years of their lives, right? You know, um, so you need only one horror story like that, and of course there are millions, um, to disprove this notion that an all-seeing, omnibenevolent God is watching over us, right? Um, so then if you're going to say, okay, well, but what if there's a divine mind that is intervening far more casually and capriciously and without rhyme or reason, and yet, is, well, but, okay, well, what good is that to anyone? You know, it's practically a, you know, that's a, a, an, an autistic god with a roulette wheel. I mean, what are we what are we alleging here, right? Like, what are we praying to in that case? Um, or Ironically, then we're god. back to sort of a, a conception of Zeus or something like that, right? These right. very human gods with uh, uh, you know very human Highly instincts imperfect. and yeah. desires and jealousies and so on, right? Um, let me go to what I'm in some way more interested in which is the political implications of religion. Um, and I want to ask you two related questions, one of which uh, is sort of grand and more historical, and the second that I'll come to later is sort of applying that to the American context. So, um, you know, I have become quite convinced that there are certain basic aspects of human psychology which drive our behavior, that we, as Jonathan Haidt would say, groupish that we, uh, you know, tend to form groups very easily, often treat members of those groups with great compassion and great altruism, but we're also capable of treating anybody who's not a member of those groups with incredible cruelty and, and nastiness. Um, and if that's a basic mechanism of humanity, then the way in which that has become activated so often through history, obviously, is religion. Right. Uh, there's other mechanisms as well, but this is one of a really important one. Right. I'm a Christian. You're not. I don't owe any duties to you. I'm a 
Catholic, you're Protestant. I don't any, owe any duty to you. I'm a Shia, you're a Sunni. I don't owe any duty to you, and so on and so forth. Right? Um, but if we think that what's going on here is actually uh, a set of human capacities that are baked into how we operate, then it's not as clear to me as it might seem at first sight that an absence of religion would lessen human conflict or would lessen human suffering. Because mm -hmm. with our infinite ability to invent lines, to distinguish my group from your group, we would simply be driven to give more importance to ethnic differences, more important to ideological political differences, more importance to all kinds of other differences we might be able to emphasize or concoct. So I guess my question is, do you think that if people for the last 2000 years hadn't believed in these different religions, um, would we have had fewer conflicts or would we just have had different conflicts? Well, I mean, a simple way to answer that question is to just imagine what it would take to improve our religions. I mean, forget about getting rid of religion, just imagine modifying the Ten Commandments so as to produce a wiser, less divisive ideology, right? That would be trivially easy to do. You know, you just swap out the the uh, you know, the, the no graven image clause for something truly useful, like um, you know, don't keep slaves, right? Don't don't own people and treat them like farm equipment, right? I mean, that's just that would be that would have closed the door theologically to slavery, whereas the door, as you know, was wide open for centuries because the Bible on balance support slavery it certainly doesn't condemn it and you know even Jesus doesn't condemn it so it's easy to see how we could improve the Bible or the Quran you know the the, the Quran could have been a document that just assiduously spelled out the political equality of men and women but it doesn't do that of course it, it assiduously spells out the political inequality of men and women right and and women, the world over are paying the price for that. You know, in this very day, women in Iran are protesting, uh, to, you know, fighting and, and in many cases dying to carve out some space of equality for themselves politically. Um, so it's easy to see how we can improve. We can improve these documents and and the, the resulting faiths. And so there's no argument against doing that, right? If we could, um, and we we have effectively done that just because we have, over the course of many centuries of, of smashing religion against secular ethics and scientific rationality, we have taught generations of people that uh, being a true fundamentalist just isn't worth it, right? It's just not, it doesn't get you the life you, you actually want and are right to want. And so most people, even fundamentalists, frankly, in the West, have relaxed their hold on religious literalism uh, and when and where people don't do that, you have something fairly extraordinary in this day and age, which is you have something like the Taliban or you know the Islamic State, where people are really, uh, you know, really have the courage of their convictions and say, you know, no, no, we're we're going to live by the letter of this thing. We're going to keep sex slaves. We're going to cut people's heads off, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's what you get. So uh, it's a, um, I mean, I don't think we're condemned not to make progress um, in overcoming our native tribalism and xenophobia, because we, we, we've already made immense progress even under the shadow of these divisive uh, and tribal identities, right? And, and it, so the identities could have been much, much better. The beliefs could have been much better. Um, we could have had something like enlightenment-based secular rationality, you know, centuries before we did. Right, and and we only got it by in in direct zero sum contest with a very intolerant and, and overweening church authority. Right, I mean scientists were literally dying trying to uh, interrogate the, the the nature of the world. Um, you know, it's just you got you, you got the, the the house arrest of Galileo is the kind of one of the, the final one of the final moments here where. You know, you got a bunch of clerics who are, um, you know, glassy-eyed religious maniacs who won't look through his telescope, and you've got a terrified scientist 
pretending to believe uh, as they do, and you know, kind of basically disavowing his his thesis. Um, and that's where we left that, and we've made progress since then. So it, it's it's um yeah, I don't I, I don't think we're. I mean, I take your point that religion is a is a uh, a very powerful piece of software for us to enshrine our groupishness. And it is, you know, that there's the, certainly an argument that it allows strangers in in you know in groups you know larger than than you know Dunbar's number of 150 uh, to cohere rather readily in you know larger in larger social organizations and then you know go to war against other groups right and so that like that's a it's easy to see how there could could have been a cultural evolution at, at, within which religion proved a very durable feature um because i you know yes if i if if i really do know something important about you whenever you pay lip service to the same god right if that is a if that can be a you know literally a shibboleth this is where we get the concept um where you you know you prove your your in group status by making you know costly sacrifices uh to in the same direction um well then that basis for trust is useful but i mean that, but that's not the only conceivable version of that kind of trust and you know now we obviously have secular democratic right. uh non otherworldly versions of that yeah, so I certainly don't mean to be fatalistic in the sense of saying human beings are groupish and therefore there's always going to be the same amount of conflict in every age. We've clearly seen that there are decades and centuries with much more conflict and much bloodier confrontations and decades and centuries with much less. And so I think one of the big tasks of the present, and I talk about a lot of that in, in my last book, My Great Experiment, is uh, to to figure out the social and cultural and political institutions we need in order to keep that groupishness under wraps, particularly at a moment when our societies are so diverse. Um, but but to push you a little bit further on this point, I do think that in uh, you know some of the work of the four uh, horsemen of the apocalypse, including you, there is a, a sort of blaming religion for all of the conflicts in which religion was invoked. And in a sense, that seems fair and natural. I think that in many ways, those religious conflicts were the proximate cause of the 30 years war, of all of those mm -hmm. kinds of things. But if I think about this, and it's a really large question that social scientists don't have uh, a good way to answer, so we rarely ask them. But if I think about it with the basic tools of social science, which is counterfactual causation, right? I want to ask, okay, well, what would have happened realistically, if those religions weren't around, if Christianity hadn't arisen, um, uh, you know, around the time of year zero, because that's how we mm -hmm. count, um, if 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 uh, the Quran hadn't uh, been written uh, a number of centuries later and so on. And I, I, I actually find it really hard to answer that question, because on the one hand, uh, one really powerful source of conflict would not have been in the world. On the other hand, um, as you're saying, one really powerful source of uh, large group solidarity would not have been there, which might have increased the chance of much more small scale endemic uh, warfare, of much more conflict at the level of one village against the next in ways that might have made it even harder to sustain human civilization. Um, uh, and there may have come into being some alternative set of uh, ideologies or set of political or, or social, cultural, linguistic, racial divisions, which would have taken the place of those mm. religious conflicts. And it's really hard to know what those would have been like and how much conflict they would have caused. So I guess when I think about the last 2,000 years of human history, I think it's fair to say that religion was a proximate cause of an awful lot of suffering. And that's a very good reason to be skeptical of it. But I find it hard to have any real handle on whether the world really would have been better if those religions, Christianity and Islam in this context in particular, uh, had not arisen. Yeah, well, I, I think it's it's okay to remain agnostic about that. I mean, counter counterfactuals are hard, obviously. Uh, 
but I mean, I, I, I think one could easily argue that, that, uh, you know, had, had Christianity not won out and, and paganism had endured, you know, that might've been a better road toward religious tolerance uh, for the, the next millennium. Right. So, um, but whatever is the case there, even if we knew that, you know, d during the childhood of our species, religion was absolutely essential for our survival, right? Even if, let's say, let's take it right up into the, you know, to the 20th century. Let's say we just knew that nothing good was going to happen, nothing better could have happened through, you know, World War II, but for our, you know, our, you know, full embrace of our religious heritage. Um, the question is what to do now, right? I mean, what, what, what's the role of the, that religion is playing now? You know, how, how, um, certain do we want a U.S. president to be that death is an illusion and that if you're a good Christian, you get everything you want after you die, right? You know, when I, when we have a U.S. president who says he, you know, in the, in the, in the darkness of his closed eyes, he consulted his creator and formed an intuition about whether to go to war, right? Is, is that is that good news? Uh, and how is it? How does how does that confession change if he says he was talking to God through his hair dryer, right? I mean, the, he's talking to God through his hair dryer. He's obviously a lunatic, a dangerous lunatic, and we have to get him out of the White House, right? But if he's just doing it on the natch, well, then he's just a Christian, right? So, you know, the, uh, you know, well, we can we can grant that. There's some distance between what people profess to believe and what they really believe. But when people really, really believe these things, how consoled should we be? I mean, how much do you want your airline pilot to really believe in the power of prayer? Right. I mean, because if you really believe in the power of prayer, right, then that has consequences, uh, you know, actual or potential consequences. You know what? Like, you know, if you, imagine a pilot who really believes in the power of prayer, right, who will fly into a thunderstorm knowing that it's, you know, it's, it's certainly elevating the risk of catastrophe for himself and all his passengers, but no, no, he knows God's, you know, riding shotgun with him, right? Because he's just a true believer. Well, that's, you know, in my view, that's a disaster, right? We, that's precisely the kind of pilot you don't want. So um, you can, you can multiply those examples, uh, obviously. And I think everywhere, what you want are people whose convictions scale with good reasons and good evidence and good arguments and and intuitions that are tutored by intellectual honesty and and you know and honest collisions with the opinions and and evidence of other people so that there there's a, a certain kind of humility and circumspection and and discomfort with illogic and desire for consistency and i mean the whole toolkit we have that's been so hard won that is eroding in various places, not just religious places. And we've got this postmodern effort to, you know, that's happening over in Wokistan that is making everything seem upside down. Um, and to the degree that it's insane and, and divisive and intolerable, it is those things because it so much resembles a new religion, right? I mean, that's what, that's what's so awful about wokeness. It's, is it's intellectual dishonesty and its willingness to sacrifice obviously innocent people as as you know scapegoats, um, etc. So, uh, I just think that if we're going to be honest about what we value and how we can safeguard what we value, reason and curiosity and and honesty are are our primary tools there. And in addition to love, obviously, and love, but you don't need. Uh, to believe anything irrational in order to recognize that you love other people and that your world and your your life gets better the more you you love other people and the, and the more you have you know good reason to love them the there are a lot of scholars who claim that uh the foundations of liberalism and democracy uh, are ultimately religious that a lot of the beliefs that ground the American Republic, a lot of the beliefs which ground uh, human rights uh, actually are religious and they're a kind of, uh, you know, secular version of Christianity, which is always trying to hide its true nature or its true origins. What, what do you make of that line of, of, of arguments? Can we ground 
uh, a deep belief in these important political values uh, without recourse, explicit or implicit to religion? Yeah, well, I think we obviously can. It's just, um, I mean, I, I think people draw the wrong lesson from the observation that the roots of of much of what we value are religious, right? So if you go back far enough, I mean, it's true even today, but it gets more and more true as you push back into history. And you look at every good thing that human beings have done, it's true to say that virtually all of those good things, most of the time, were accomplished by people who believed in God, right? And, and so what lesson should you draw from that? Um, I would say there's no lesson to draw from that because there was simply no one else to do the job. Right. So like you could say that every bridge that was ever built was, you know, for the most part, built by people of faith. You know, every hospital, every, you know, for the longest time, every scientific experiment run was done by somebody who at least professed some belief in God. Um, but the question is, are those beliefs uh, actually intrinsic to the enterprise and, and essential to it? And uh, or are they just adding friction to all the good things to you could do if you if you let those if you let a belief in Zeus you know if you got it off your hard drive right I mean what opportunity costs uh, would we be paying if we added more gods to the picture right you know it's like like there's no um, no one's tempted to say well what we really need is to is is um, we got to bring back the gods of Mount Olympus. Because they were playing, some, doing some crucial work for us, and you, you you read Homer and you read Ovid and you read all these good old books, and clearly those could not have been written without the, you know, some nominal nominal at least belief in those gods. Um, and we got we got the very idea of democracy out of you know Athens, and there's a lot of Zeus talk there, right? So um, let's let's bring back Zeus. Well, it's just a waste of time, right? And it's it, and it it's just it's indecent that we think we, we anyone would think we would have that kind of time to waste on that project. Right. Um, given all of our challenges. So, yeah, I would just say that just as you don't actually need a belief that the Bible was divinely inspired to do any good thing in science or engineering or anything else now in the, in the 21st century, you don't need it politically and you don't need it you know, you don't need it uh, philosophically or in any other way, even if you can trace back, you can trace the, the, the origin of certain ideas to religious books or religious communities, because that's that's going to be true in almost every case. Uh, ironically, this feels like an inverse of the argument I was pushing on you a little bit, right? Which is to say that I actually find it very convincing as a response to say, well, look, of course, a lot of the great artists of the last 2000 years were Christian because if you wanted to have the money to, you know, do good artworks, you had to be a Christian. And, um, you know, all the most talented art artists were, were drawn to, you know, making churches and so on, because that's the way you could really let your talents shine. Um, it doesn't mean that we wouldn't have had great art if Christianity hadn't been there and we'd had some different sort sets of beliefs. But in a way that's similar to the argument I was making about conflict, right? That, that if we hadn't had these particular lines of conflicts, we may have had different lines which people identified. We might have gotten mm -hmm. different kinds of conflicts. Um, but I, I want to move on to um, the more contemporary version of the political uh, sort of concern I have. So a lot of the pushback against atheism had a political context um, in which with a very strong evangelical movement and George W. Bush, uh, we had a moment in which Christianity felt very, very politically powerful in the United States. And there was very good reason to be concerned, for example, about efforts to stop teaching evolution in schools or to teach the controversy between the supposed controversy between evolution and um, intelligent design and so on, right? Um, and so I certainly uh, believed at the time that... Uh, the influence of Christianity in American politics was really negative, that it was dividing the country, that it was pushing it towards policies that we didn't like, that it was pushing towards a kind of anti-intellectualism, like the one which, um, you know, pretends that evolution and intelligent design are two equivalently uh, uh, well-founded theories, right? 
but we're now uh you know two decades on or 15 years on from from those debates um and the political moment feels very different and i've seen people make the argument and i don't think there's any really conclusive work on whether this is true in political science yet but there's, there seems to be some real plausibility to it but actually the relatively rapid secularization of american society over the last 15 or 20 years has a lot to do with some of our problems today that uh, you see uh, the people who have deaths of despair, who are addicted to painkillers, uh, be less likely to be religious um, because actually people who continue to have some real religious links at least have some kind of community, somewhere to go on a Sunday, some people to connect with, and that's a really stabilizing social force. Uh, but actually, a lot of the sort of most raw energy behind Donald Trump and the MAGA movement often is uh, not people who, there may be people who claim to be religious, who claim to have some kind of Christian or evangelical belief, but they're not the people who are actually embedded in a real church community by and large. They are people who are more isolated and therefore more angry. Um, and of course, as you alluded to, uh, there are people like John McWhorter and others who argue uh, that uh, even uh, wokeness is a kind of quasi-religion, which is filling a space which may be there uh, because of the decline of traditional religion on the left side of a political spectrum as well. So um, I guess applying that like much larger, much more difficult to fathom set of questions about the actual causal influence of religion over the last 2,000 years to just the time period in the United States of the last 15 or 20 years, mm -hmm. um, you know, America is secularizing. Uh, in a certain kind of way, evangelical Christianity plays less important a role in our politics today than it did 15 or 20 years ago, for I realize that there's some obvious count examples to that, like the recent Supreme Court ruling on, 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 on abortion. Um, do you think that, are you still a sanguine that a further retreat of religion would actually help to make our politics more harmonious and sane and so on? Or, or has it turned out that these beliefs, irrational as they might be, uh, have actually helped to provide an important social kit and an important civilization to our politics? And that its absence is precisely what's driven the sort of deep cultural division of a country today. Well, we we clearly have a lot of problems. I mean, I would not deny that. And uh, some of those problems could be compounded certainly in in specific people or even in any gif given generation by the loss of things to which people were attached, right? So if people are attached to a belief in Santa Claus, when you tell them there is no Santa Claus, they suffer, right? I mean, this is actually, this is true of kids. You know, the kids don't don't tend to like to hear that Santa Claus is a, is a lie their parents told them, right? Um, so something is lost, but then the question is, is there really a Santa Claus-shaped hole in someone's life, you know, that's, that's indelible, that needs to be filled with a Santa Claus-shaped object at some point in the future? Or can we grow up, right? Can we, can we make progress that gives us greater capacities and greater understanding and a greater basis for love and compassion and self-transcendence and and solidarity and community and everything else we where we want and and a right to want right so so community is is a very good thing and the pe and people who don't have it right or people who have lost it are suffering you know certainly most of them are uh in in various ways and that's understandable and that's that is a problem that requires a remedy Right. But the, so so, yes, it could be that we're in this kind of, you know, um, valley between two high spots where we've kind of get, kind of descended a a a relatively um, mediocre uh, peak on this landscape in search of a higher one. But we've had to do, we've had to go downhill a bit in order to to then, you know, climb higher on some other part of the landscape. I mean, so it's, it's not that progress is is just monotonically pleasant where things just get better and better and better and better with every increment of change i, I don't i don't imagine that and um so yes i we you know we could be paying some kind of price for secularizing and secularizing rapidly and that that's true 
Um, and certainly any individual, again, could feel like he or she has paid a price for losing their faith in God. And, and, and faith in God really does do a lot of work for people who really have it. I mean, especially around the, the, the phenomenon of death and, and bereavement, right? I mean, when, when, when you're contemplating your own death or the death of someone you love, and you sincerely believe that death is an illusion, and that you, you not only do you not lose anything of importance when you die or when someone close to you dies, that person gets everything they want and they get it for eternity, right? And you will be reunited with your child or your mother or whoever it is in a few short years, and you'll be on the right hand of Jesus, and there's just there is no problem, right? This this universe is just set up to reward and console you in the end, right? That is, if you espouse the, the right uh, opinions while alive, in those crucial moments while alive, you know, even even on death row, even if you've, you know, murdered and, and raped your way through life um, and, uh, you know, ordered a chicken dinner as your final meal, um, as long as you come to Jesus in those in those last moments, if that's if that's your faith, uh, I suppose this works for Islam as well. You're good, and um, whereas someone who doesn't pay, say those things, those, those, those per, doesn't actually mouth that incantation at the end, but has lived a an impeccably moral life, uh, that person will not be so lucky, right? So that's, I mean, we can talk about how perverse that moral worldview is in the end. Um, but the, I mean, I think I would add here that. My big picture concern, and and really the, the I think the proper lens through which to view all of this is that all we have in any moment in time is human conversation with which to orient ourselves collectively, right? I mean, we've, we're we're faced with this circumstance of being uh, of of having a a truly open ended, a hopefully open ended challenge of cooperating in the face of uncertainty with now 8 billion strangers for the most part. And the question is, how good could human life be given that that's our situation? And what are the tools by which we can navigate that situation? And given that all we have, I mean, you know, all we have is persuasion, you know, if that's a, a word I know you like, um, or force. Right. And so so on the cooperation side and the conversation side, it is really a you know a theater of persuasion. And so what allows people to persuade each other and what is there to appeal to? It's you know patently obvious to me that you can't appeal to non-negotiable ancient dogmas for which there is no evidence uh, and which are not universally subscribed, right? Um so really, at bottom, there is nothing that a Christian and Muslim can agree about when it when it really comes when push comes to shove, you know, when it comes to the you know the question of the divinity of Jesus, say, um, which the Christians really do care about and the Muslims really do repudiate, right? Um, and that's a problem, right? So that's not the best situation. That's not the best parameter. Those aren't the best parameters for a conversation that is going to engineer real open ended uh, solutions to an a, a absolute blizzard of coordination problems that we have to solve in real time so as not to ruin everything you know so the, the nature is going to be throwing up pandemics uh, and we may throw up some ourselves through you know malfeasance in various labs um, or deliberately uh, through terrorism uh, and we're going to have a host of other problems and then the question is how can we rationally and compassionately interact with each other so as to solve those problems. And the cast of mind that is certain about religion, I would argue, and requires you know no proof, uh, and is and is bent upon misconstruing, you know, every scintilla of pseudo proof as proof positive of its dogmas. That is the cast of mind that brings us other irrational eruptions of of. Um, of hatred and and division, like you know something like QAnon, right? I mean, we've got some the tens of millions of people in American society right now who claim to believe that the world is being run by child raping cannibals. 
Now, again, we can wonder whether or not they really do believe these things and what, I mean, because the claims are as preposterous as can be, but they're not really much more preposterous than the claims of religion. They're just, you know, modern tweaks on those claims. And that's, and it's, it's those, those kinds of people, again, the tens of millions of them in, in our society have been trained to think that way, right? I mean, that's the, that's the level, the level of intellectual honesty that gets you QAnon, to my eye, is exactly the level that gets you evangelical Christianity and all of its Bible thumping well, but, conviction. But, but in what sense have people been trained to uh, adhere to QAnon, right? So, so you know, religion, they've been trained to believe for 2,000 years through very sophisticated institutions, right? Through parochial schools and Sunday schools and uh, youth groups and, you know, a broader culture, all of which, um, you know, imbues the idea that, uh, you know, Christianity is uh, uh, a rational and true set of beliefs, right? So I buy the claim there that there's this huge machinery that keeps it going, right? But what seems to have happened, and obviously some people believe both in Christianity and QAnon, but what seems to have happened is that actually as the belief of these uh, organized religions with somewhat stable theologies has declined. You know, mm. you and I hoped that people would embrace science and rationality and and evidence-based reasoning and the basic values of the Enlightenment and all of those things that you and I equally care about, right? But what seems to be happening is that suddenly it becomes a lot easier to get a whole bunch of people to believe in QAnon conspiracy theories. And so well, um, well, I would I would think that there's massive overlap between QAnon and evangelical Christianity. I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't know if any polling exists on this topic, but I would bet these are not, for the most part, atheists. Right. I, mean, I, I would, you know, sight unseen, I would bet a fair amount of money that that atheism does not correlate with QAnon. And so my sense, and again, I, does. I I can't cite a particular poll for I've looked at a bunch of polls and those of the impression I got from them is that probably somebody who believes in QAnon is likely to be a Christian. For us, also a fair share of non-Christians. But I think they're less likely to be a member of uh, an organized church. So they're much less likely to actually right. go to church on Sunday, right? They're less right. likely to have real meaningful ties to a Christian community. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, we, I mean, QAnon is, is not, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's more complicated perhaps than I've suggested in, in, by making that comparison because it, it's a social and political phenomenon and it's not, it's obviously not otherworldly and, and, uh, eschatological, like a like a religion, like Christianity. So it's 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 a Venn diagram, and these are kind of overlapping sets of concerns, but it's not the same same set. Um, I would I would just say that it just it's hard to be reasonable and rational, right? And it doesn't come naturally to us. And as you mentioned John, Jonathan Haidt, right? I mean, one of the things he emphasizes in his work is just how irrational we tend to be even when we profess to be rational right so much of our reasoning on his account is a lawyer a lawyerly post hoc self act of self persuasion that you know our gut intuitions are justified but we got there based on our intuitions we, you know let, let's say the moral intuition that certain things are are disgusting or you know worth condemning um and then we don't really reason like moral philosophers. We reason like lawyers and 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 publicists. You know, now I don't. You know, Jonathan and I, and I don't totally agree about that. But um, and and more important, I mean, the place where we I think we diverge more is I think any one of us or any large you know or or individuals by the millions can make a fair amount of progress. I mean, this is what education is. Right? I mean, what does it mean to actually be educated? And what what does it mean to live a an examined life beyond, you know, four years of college, you know, does education, does moral education and intellectual growth stop at, you know, your senior year in college, or does it, you know, push into graduate school uh, and stop there? Or does it, you know, or do we, you know, if we're lucky, do we each get like a, 
you know, a 60 year or 70 year postdoc in becoming a mensch, right? And I, I think we do. And there are ways to do that. Um, and, you know, intellectual honesty and, uh, you know, uh, you know, a few other, you know, crucial pieces of software um, are, are hard won, you know, and it, it takes, it takes a lot of, um, it takes culture. It takes a, wa a wise culture to intrude into your life and into your, you know, your rampant wishful thinking. Um, and it takes a certain tolerance for the discomfort of the, you know, of those collisions um, to actually make progress and to grow. But, but surely there's a difference between two different questions, right? One of which is, is it part of the most meaningful life to live an examined life and does that require you to interrogate these beliefs that are passed down from grandma and i think both you and i and probably a lot of listeners to this podcast are committed to that enterprise right that's why we're the sorts of people you and i who make our living through thinking and talking and writing about the world that's why uh, the people who are listening to us right now are taking you know a, a, a long amount of time out of a day to 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 think about these big questions right um but not everybody has that preference right some people that, that's just not what they see as the meaning of a life and that's just not what what they care about but that's 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 one kind of question right another question is well if everybody lived an examined life like that or if everybody tried to or simply if uh, those ideas were no longer effectively passed down from grandma to 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 grandchild would the world become a better place and to go back uh, a couple of beats what you are saying is, hey, look, you know, perhaps it's true that when you look at this political moment in the United States and many other countries around the world, there's, there seems to be a kind of argument that there's some pain from the loss of uh, uh, religion, that secularization seems to be leading uh, perhaps to a greater availability of people who uh, can believe in QAnon, who can believe in, 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 in you know, the... Uh, great uh, uh, positive uh, impact of people like Donald Trump, who, who who can sort of substitute older religious beliefs with a faith and some kind of woke ideology, right? Um, mm. But eventually that'll go away, right? We're in a kind of bad part of a U-shaped curve, right? But once sort of everybody is going to uh, rid themselves of these beliefs, that actually will be better. But what if that's not the case, right? What if the people who are actually capable and interested in the examined life, as as we talked about it, are, are really small in number? And when you untether people from those uh, traditional beliefs, which have many downsides, but also some upsides in filling empty space and 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 in coming with certain moral precepts, actually we're gonna get more and more and more people being willing to believe QAnon and all kinds of other ideologies. And they might shift incredibly rapidly from one ideology to another. Um, they might be able, we might end up believing some ideologies that are much more hateful than, than traditional religions. And, and, and so it doesn't turn out that we're at the bottom of a U-shaped curve. It, it, it might turn out that we're in the middle of uh, a line that just, you know, points down. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess, why should we have this faith that, um, these phenomena we're seeing at the moment are this temporary phenomenon that's going to get better uh, rather than that they are a harbinger of what will happen in a pretty atomized society like the United States when, as seems likely, given recent trends, religion comes to play an even smaller role here than it does at the moment. Well, the question seems to presuppose that we have a choice, right? That we can decide to pull the brakes on secularization or atheism and preserve these ancient beliefs in good standing among all the people who are apparently losing them, right? Well, and, not necessarily. You can just, it, 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 I'm just interested to sort of, as somebody who's not religious myself and who's very sympathetic to enterprise, I'm just trying to understand, you know, how much we blame religion for the bad things in the past and how much hope or fear should we have for that decline? That's an important mm -hmm. question, whether or not you think that there's some meaningful way to affect it. I certainly am not about to say we should somehow try and 
you know, make everybody believe in an ideology or in a set of, mm. you know, theological views that I myself don't believe in, but it, I think it's unlikely that I'm going to come, you know, end up in that position. Um, but I do want to know, should I be hopeful for, for, for more secularization in the United States, or should I actually feel quite uneasy about it because it might have these really bad political consequences? Well, I, I think you should be... Um... I think we should all be increasingly allergic to dogmatism, especially when when the dogmas are, um, you know, obviously leading to needless human suffering and division. Right. So, uh, so like again, it's it, it's useful to look at specific religious ideas or or you know, any ideas, political ideas, and then ask the question: Well, do do we do, do we keep this? You know, if if we had a choice, would we want to would would we want to reinvent this crazy idea uh, because it's so useful, right? So, and just you just take your pick. You know, homosexuality is immoral, right? Like that that, that comes to us courtesy of religion. You know, maybe it has old older roots still, but it's certainly been enshrined in various religions. Uh, how useful is it? You know, how how good is our world? Um, how improved is it socially and ethically that millions and millions of people insist that this dogma is true without any, I mean, it is the very essence of a dogma. They don't have a real justification for it. It's just, it's what they think is God has insisted is true. And if God had insisted otherwise, presumably they would believe that, you know, you could imagine, you know, it had, uh, you know, the ancient Greeks gotten their hands on the Bible at the, the crucial moment, they might have relaxed some of that, you know, homophobia. Um, and we would have, you know, certainly, you know, gay people through the generations would have lived in a different world had that been the case, right? You wouldn't have had Oscar Wilde thrown in, 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 uh, in prison for being gay. Um, and, you know that so that, that that would be a net net good i don't see anything I, you know I, I don't see if we could do this piecemeal and just strip out specific dogmas i do, i think we could do that wisely and and we're right to want to do that now and we've been doing that obviously politically over time but the, the problem is we're 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 doing it with with you know one hand tied behind our back because the people, you know, even the people who are doing it quite heroically, for the most part, are still attached to these religious myths and these religious books and these religious identities. I mean, even our, you know, our mutual friend Andrew Sullivan, right, who's done as much as anyone, uh, and perhaps more than anyone in American society, to to get us into the end zone where we now have gay marriage being the law of the land, right? I mean, he, you know, he almost did that single handedly, uh, to my eye. But he's a believing Catholic, and you know he and I have debated these issues, and he can't, you know, is any. I mean, Andrew is fantastic; he's brilliant. But but anyone who is forced to be on the other side of this debate from me on this topic loses thirty IQ points just based on their religious attachment, right? I mean, it's, they're, the ballast they're carrying just can't get up the hill, right? It's just. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it would be better had God not said that homosexuality was a sin in the various ways he said it um, in both the Old and New Testament. And um, there are a hundred, a hundred very important examples like that, that where we could make our world a better place and leave and, you know, and edit that, you know, edit these books if we could edit them, uh, which again, which most you know, certainly modern, cosmopolitan, well-educated religious people do by their disregard of those passages, right? People effectively edit the books by just deciding not to pay attention to the parts they don't like. And, and But I'm just saying we could be more intellectually honest than that and recognize that all we've got is human conversation. And the, the, the question is, do we want a 21st century conversation where we avail ourselves of all the useful concepts and ideas insofar as they are useful? And we can take, you know, we can take what we like from Shakespeare and what we like from Pericles and what we like from St. Paul and what we like from Jesus and what we like from the Quran and 
and consider it a bequest from prior generations of merely human, but still, you know, fairly incandescent wisdom, um, which we can improve upon, hopefully, as we, you know, push into the into the unknown future. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to move on from religion sure. um, and uh, try and understand how you think about this cultural moment. Um, you know, I'm struck thinking about the about 15 years that I've now spent in the United States, how much the basic intellectual layer of the land has transformed. And it seems to me that the two fundamental changes have been uh, the transformation of uh, the American right um, from uh, the Republican Party of George W. Bush, which, as we've been invoking, was uh, not to be celebrated in every respect, which had many flaws within it, um, but to the Republican Party of somebody like Donald Trump, which I do think is just uh, a fundamentally bigger threat to, to American democracy and to decency. Um, and then on the other hand, the sort of strange transformation of the left uh, in which uh, this sort of single-minded focus on uh, identity and the marginalization of uh, mm. ethnic, religious, racial, sexual, gender groups uh, has taken center place in a way that wasn't the case 15 years ago and has sometimes, not always, but sometimes gone hand in hand with a real embrace and tolerance for uh, pretty liberal ideas. Um, so sort of how worried are you about each of these forces, the confluence of these forces, and is this an intellectual moment that's going to pass, or is this setting up the battle lines for the politics of the next 25, 50 years. Well, I, you know, I'm not really in the game of, of making predictions across any uh, time horizon of that sort. I mean, I, I think the one prediction I feel like I could make is that if Trump or any, any, anyone sufficiently Trumpist runs in 2024 for the presidency, the woke problem doesn't go away anytime soon. I, I think it. I think really, you know, if we had a normal Republican candidate for twenty twenty four, I feel that the, the wokeness, you know, the, the 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 moral derangement of the left, has reached some kind of tipping point, and the vapors will dissipate, you know, on their own. But the the craziness of Trumpistan is so provocative and so seemingly justifying of the craziness in Wokistan that they're really, they, they just, they mutually create one another at this point. So if Trump runs in 2024 and, you know, if he wins um, or somebody who is just appealing to the Trumpist cult with the same, um, same politics, wins uh i just yeah i think we i have no uh, then i have no intuitions as to how long this thing lasts but i really i really do feel and this that does, get... i agree with you but this does seem to seem seem to go both ways right so certainly i think yeah. one of the reasons why uh couldn't get woke ideas became so hegemonic in, in not just in the american left but in some mainstream institutions um in the second half of it 2010s was that when Trump was in office, it both seemed to justify uh, the most extreme claims, um, and it made it very toxic to argue against any left-wing position because you would be seen as running interference for Trump. And conversely, I think one of the reasons why it's so hard to beat Donald Trump, why somebody who's not in fact very popular in the breadth of the American population can nevertheless come close to winning re-election in 2020 and might come close or might in fact succeed in winning in 2024, is that so many Americans look at what's happened on the left and what looks at what the kind of abuses that happen in some mainstream institutions and say, well, I don't trust these guys. I may as well hold my nose and vote for Trump. So, so you know, there does seem to be a kind of yin and yang effect here. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. And it, it, it worries me and it's really... Um... 
I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the variables are that will determine whether Trump runs and whether he wins at this point. I mean, I, I think if I the truth is, I and this is something that you know I would love your opinion on. I don't know who the Democrats will or should run against him, right? I mean, like I obviously it just seems obvious to me that it can't be Biden and it can't be Harris. So you know, the the, the president and the vice president in in my mind are unelectable. Um, so who runs? I, I, I don't know. Um, but if the democratic party can't recognize that, you know, and just has to run Biden or has to run Harris, I think we, we've got a real problem. And if they run somebody else and that person doubles down on, on identity politics, I think we have a real problem. So yeah, I, I do. If, if we could get normal you know, politically normal, they're totally uninspiring, left and right. Uh, I think many things improve for us. Uh, whatever other challenges await us, I mean, we're you know we could be on the cusp of of World War Three, and and still, I think you know things get th things get better if we could just find a way of of turning those two knobs on the left and the right. Why is that so hard? You know, when I look at opinion polls on particular issues, uh, most Americans are pretty reasonable. Even on really contested questions like abortion, you know, most mm -hmm. Americans broadly favor a set of laws which uh, most European countries have on the books. Germany, France, Italy, uh, Spain, Sweden, Denmark, in various forms have on the books. Uh, but which no American political party at this point actually institutionally stands for. Um, and, you know, I just picked that because that's one of the most controversial and one of the most seemingly polarized issues. And actually, it turns out that there is uh, a majority in the United States that uh, favors those laws, which broadly say mm. that you should have free access to abortion in the first trimester and uh, some significant restrictions after that, though, obviously, with exceptions in cases of serious threat to the life of a mother and so on. Um, uh, why is it that uh, on issue after issue after issue, what average Americans believe is actually pretty reasonable, um, and yet political parties don't seem to cater for that? Um, they don't seem to be able to set themselves up in such a way as to you know, win a crushing majority and then perhaps force the other political party to follow suit and moderate as well. Mm. Well, again, this is a topic I, I think you know much more about than I do, but I, I would have, um, I would guess that it has something to do with our, you know, our two party system and our primary system and our, our, uh, just the actual mechanics by which we elect people. Um, I would also say that it probably has something to do with the religiosity of America. You know, the fact that the, the left has you know for as long as we've been alive you know for as long as there's been a country uh has been in opposition to uh some version of theocracy right and that has morphed that morphed under trump and we have you know the, the really grotesque spectacle of you know evangelical christians uh joining a person a, a a obviously unchristian personality cult so as to ram through their their theocratic agenda right and and um and there is a i think it's even it's even it's not quite as cynical and instrumental as all that i really do think there's a love for trump that is sincere right it's not just they're not just using him as a battering ram uh, i think a lot of these these um uh, uh, believing Christians really do really are part of the personality cult. I mean, they really do I admire him deeply. And, um, and that's pretty ins inscrutable given that he, you know, in his every pore represents the, the nullification of Christian values or at least standard Christian values. Right. Um, so there's more, it's, you know, it's, it's complex, um, but it is cultic. Right. And it has, you know, and to call it cultic is to say that it's unreasoning and not amenable to reason and that, you know, persuasion fails. And you got people who are just not open to argument and evidence. And there's just nothing that could prove as a as a um, a reductio ad absurdum of their beliefs, you know, even when it is, in fact, 
uh, reductio and they, and they're they're in conflict with themselves and they just refuse to acknowledge it right and so they they've kicked themselves loose of the earth um uh, and there's no talking to them right so then so then the question is what to do when you get a sufficient number of people like that uh you know shrieking on the sidewalks of your society um and that's the political problem we we've, we've got it sounded as though you were saying a little while ago that you know, if only Trump and, and, and sort of one of his followers doesn't win again in 2024, if only mm. the sort of threat from the anti-democratic right would subside a little bit, it feels like we're at a turning point where people are willing to reject some of the sort of more out there ideas that have somehow been able to capture mainstream institutions in the last five or seven years. Um uh, that feels like you're being more optimistic yeah. in one moment than the other. So how optimistic yeah, or pessimistic yeah. should we be? Well, yeah, the, well, the truth is, I don't know how hopeful that uh, that prediction is. I mean, it, it does feel somehow contaminated by hope. Uh, and I don't know how uh, influenced it is by my just having paid so much attention to this issue and gotten so tired of it that it's just, I, I just feel like, oh, this is just, there's no way this is going to, this mania is going to continue for that much longer. But I just I do feel like more and more people behind behind closed doors have have uh, broken the spell, right? I mean, it's just like you just it there there is I mean the problem is on the left. I mean, so there there really there's some crucial asymmetries here to notice, and they're and they're they make it difficult to talk about this. You know our politics uh, certainly in 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 short form, and in anything like sound bites in, in a rational way. But I mean, what's wrong with the far right is so obvious uh, that it it almost requires no discussion. I mean, like what's wrong with being a neo-Nazi? What's wrong with being a a a true xenophobe? What's wrong? I mean, so it's like that's just it's it's not ethically interesting or intellectually interesting to try to to parse that there's not really nothing to parse and that's why i spend very little time thinking about it although you know i am worried about the far right and i'm worried about its the possibility of far right violence and i'm worried about the the weird variants in trumpistan that are you know not quite necessarily far right in in all the in all the usual ways but they're profoundly undemocratic and they're and they're profoundly disordered by bad ideas um but the far left and its influence on the rest of culture and its influence on our on our our really our core institutions, you know, is is far harder to understand. It's far more confusing to well-educated and well-intentioned people. Like, what's wrong with Black Lives Matter? I, I said something, you know, in passing that seemed to disparage Black Lives Matter. What are you insane? I mean, how can you? How can there be anything wrong with Black Lives Matter? Don't Black Lives Matter, Sam? What you, you racist bastard, right? Like that. That is a. It requires a conversation to get many ordinary liberals for who you know who have day jobs and don't spend, you know, all their time in the weeds of Twitter, you know, reading Thomas Chatterton Williams and 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 others who have been so eloquent on this topic. Um, what could be wrong with Black Lives Matter? It's it's just it, it is you're going to default to thinking that is a perfect articulation of the political needs of the moment, and it was obvious when you watched the murder of George Floyd that we had witnessed a racist lynching, right? I mean that that you know I saw it with my own eyes, right? Um, what more is there to say about that? And and the inclination to say any more about that betrays um, some unwholesome motive, if not frank racism on your part, right? Or, ra or a racist disregard of the problem of racism and the suffering of born of inequality in our society, right? So it, it's, it's, it's harder to talk about, and yet it is no less dishonest. Ibram X. Kendi is no less dishonest than uh, you know some analogous lunatic on the right. I mean, I just think he is poisonously dishonest right and he won't he won't debate anyone who could mop the floor with him and and reveal his dishonesty right he won't talk to glenn lowry or john mcward or coleman hughes or thomas chatterton williams or any of these guys who have his number right um and 
and he he's built a temple of white guilt for himself and, and there are other priests in, in this temple and it's a good gig it's a good gig and it works at the aspen ideas festival right and um but what is really happening is we have our core institutions from the new york times to harvard to our scientific journals to hollywood to you know media generally that's not right wing all of it being vitiated by public displays of dishonesty and masochism and frank stupidity that should be intolerable to all of us and i think is it, it is growing intolerable and um if we could just get trump out of the picture i think people could on the left could begin to be publicly honest about it right because privately they're being honest about it you know i'm, I'm not encountering the same kind of confusion from people who are not who are still terrified to say anything in public but in private they they see the world as i do they know I may mean, here just to take one claim that sort of cuts through the the morass here I mean, not only, I mean, you, you said that there's not a lot of of active racism keeping, uh, you know, qual qualified black people out of good jobs and, and, and educational opportunities and all the rest. I mean, you said something like that. I mean, to you can go further than that. You can say that, you know, at the same level of qualification, it is a positive advantage to be black at this point in almost any part of society that you know it, it would be truly desirable to a qualified candidate whether it's you're looking for an educational opportunity or you want to work in media or you want to work in in you know in tech or in you know a fortune 500 company um being a black applicant or being a you know a person of color more generally um at the same level of qualification you're America is your oyster at this moment. I mean, you, you, this is just a fact, right? You, you talk to you talk to anyone at any of these companies. You talk to anyone in an Ivy League institution in admissions. You talk to I mean, it's just you talk to any nonprofit. They are desperate to hire qualified people of color. And if you're white or you're Asian, you are at a positive disadvantage, right? Generally speaking, right? In medical schools, and I mean, it's just. It is a fact, and basically everyone knows it, right? And so what's happening on the left is you have a generation of activists determined to lie about all of that, determined to say that not only is that not true, the opposite is true, and racism is the cause, right? The reason why there are not more black cardiologists in your local hospital is because of racism, right? The reason why there's not 13% of everyone everywhere in good in good places in our society is racism today and it's just not true the the opposite is true you know the, the it's it's just you just look at at um i mean it, it admissions criteria for colleges are um you know this problem in microcosm it's like a, it is just a fact that harvard has to have a racist policy against asians now in order to meet its affirmative action goals, right? And this is something that's, you know, I think is going to reach the Supreme Court in short order. Um, it's um, so it's it's a lying about all of that that is so divisive, and 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 the gaslighting about all of that. And again, I, again, I don't want to be read as somebody who's not concerned and concerned about and sympathetic to the. The very real disparities in our society. I mean, I just I I, I want these disparities to uh, uh, be remediated in some way, and it's the question is how to do that. But calling finding racists where no racists exist, you know, rolling into the the board of a a company that is desperate to hire qualified people of color. Uh, and feels exactly as you and I do about the divisions in our society, rolling in there as Robin D'Angelo and calling everyone racist and taking them to task for their white privilege. Um, that is just, um, again, that it, it, it is a it is a symptom of a moral panic. It is leading to cultic behavior that is mirroring the cultic behavior of the 
the right and and uh, of the personality cult of Trump. Um, and it's driving everyone crazy. I have many follow-up questions I, I would love to yeah. ask you, but but um, I've taken a lot of your time and I want to uh, make sure to end on a topic that I'm perhaps the least comfortable with in this entire conversation. Sure. Uh, and that's meditation. Um, you are uh, a great evangelist of, of, of meditation. Um, uh, you talk powerfully about its, 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 its effects. Um, for some of the same reasons that make me uh, skeptical of religion, I'm also skeptical of meditation, uh, which is to say I didn't grow up with it. Uh, I'm not the sort of person to whom holiness speaks. You know, I don't like the atmosphere of church where you're supposed to sit still and be quiet and have a mm. facial expression which indicates um, you know, that that you're in the spirit, in the presence of some kind of important thing. So it's just it's not my vibe. Um, right. And all of those things make me reluctant about giving meditation a try. I've never properly tried to meditate. Why am I wrong about this? Why uh, mm -hmm. should I go and, and download your app or download some other kind of app or go to some kind of meeting or retreat and actually uh, uh, try to engage in this practice? Mm. Yeah, well, so there are, you know, generally speaking, there, there are two routes into taking meditation seriously or, or, be, or becoming sufficiently interested in it that you would, um, you'd pay, you know, you'd pay attention to it and look into it and, and begin practicing it. Um, one is just curiosity. I mean, it's just, it's just wanting to know more about what it's like to be you or wanting to know what more about your mind, um, wanting to discover what there may be to discover if you could only pay closer attention to your experience, right? And, and meditation is the method by which you would pay more attention to your experience. Um, but the more, the I think the more common path, and it's not antithetical to that, I mean, you can have both motives, but the, the more common motive is just to have become sensitized to your psychological suffering and to find certain types of suffering you know, less and less um, tolerable and to become interested in the mechanics of all that. Like, well, just why is it that you can't be your best self in every moment? You know, why Why is it that you you, you have, you, you got what you wanted, you worked so hard to get this thing and now you have it and the half-life of your gratification is about 15 minutes and now you're unhappy again, right? Or you're wanting something else or you're, you know, you're, you're otherwise conflicted, right? You're just not, you know, e each of us goes through our day knowing what it's like to be really happy. I mean, most, I mean, not, you know, not everyone has had this experience. I mean, there are people who have, are unlucky, you know, genetically and just circumstantially, and they, they don't have the free attention to even think about happiness, really. I mean, they've got, they've got too many problems. They're caught in a civil war or they're too poor or they're, they're too unhealthy or whatever it is. But m most of us, you know, in the course of our lives, you know, at some point in childhood and then, and so at some points thereafter have, have seen the clouds break. And we've had, we've been in, we know what it's like to have a ray of sunshine, right? We know what, we know what joy is like. We know what, what real ease of being is like. And the question is, why is that not instantaneously available to us? And, and is there some way of being, is there some way of being with the present moment, you know, whatever is arising uh, in it that allows you to feel more and more of that, right? I mean, do, do you actually need good reasons to be happy or is it possible to be happy before anything happens, before anything changes, just in the very midst of, of, uh, even a struggle, right? And, you know, meditation isn't the only tool by which to, to address this, you know, so, you know, problems of this sort, right? I mean, it's like, you know, uh, conceptual reframing of experience is, is also very powerful. I mean, you can learn to think about your experience differently. Um, you can tell yourself a different story about, you know, what, you know, various experiences mean. And, and those stories have different, you know, stories have a lot of power. 
But at a, at a layer beneath that, it's possible to notice that you're spending virtually every waking moment lost in thought. You know, you're having a conversation with yourself that sounds like white noise, and it just feels like yourself. You know, you just you 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 wake up from you know very likely a dream which you dimly remember uh, in the morning, and then you're kind of chased out of bed by your thoughts, and you think, 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 think throughout the day. Uh, and the and the structure of this thinking is somewhat paradoxical. I mean, you're at you're literally in many cases you're literally talking to someone who isn't there. I mean, you're telling yourself things you already know. You're replaying conversations that happened or almost happened or may yet happen, and you're you're only kind of dimly aware of your present moment experience through this cacophony of of discursive thought, and you're tending not to notice any of that, and all of that feels like me as the subject and center of my experience. And viewed from that side, meditation is actually not a tool or a practice or anything you're adding to your life. Once you discover how to do it, meditation is 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 nothing more than than ceasing to do something you're doing helplessly now. And it's ceasing to be distracted by thought. It's ceasing to be identified with each passing thought. And it's it's the ability to notice thought itself as an appearance in consciousness. So you, you've got sights and sounds and sensations and emotions, and you have thoughts. And um, they're all appearing spontaneously in this kind of wide open space of, of conscious awareness. Um, and when you can step back and just notice thoughts as thoughts and notice what the mind is like prior to their arising and in the very midst of their arising, but not when it's you know trimmed down to being identified with each next one, the mind becomes a very different place. It becomes it's, it's much more expansive, and it becomes and you begin to notice that there's a freedom even in the midst of struggle, right? There's a freedom even in the midst of stress that is that that can become more and more palpable, and you can sort of solve your basic problem of you know. How can I be in the world in a way that is is truly fulfilling without actually changing the world? So I'm not saying that you know there aren't projects worth pursuing. I mean, we spent this whole conversation talking about immense social projects that are, you know, that are, we both desperately want to pursue. Um and and there's no question that life can get better in, in all kinds of material and 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 social ways, but there's a psychological layer to this, which is uh, productive of so much else that that ails us, right? That is really solved uh, by recognizing that virtually all of your, our, our suffering is the product of thought and identification with thought. I mean, certainly any suffering beyond immediate you know sensory pain in the present moment any suffering born of past and future you know your your regrets about the past and your fears about the future that the mechanism by which by which that is you know doled out to you in the present is thinking without knowing that you're thinking right and meditation is nothing other than being able to wake up from that dream and then then you have a, another degree of freedom then you can decide okay well is it is it worth being angry about this thing that I was just helplessly angry about a moment ago? Sam Harris, thank you so much for this mammoth conversation. And yeah, yeah, podcast. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Yasha. Yeah, good luck. Good luck with what you're doing. I, I admire the, the platform you've built and I'm a subscriber to, to your newsletter. And so keep going. I, I love your podcast. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's great to see. Thank you. That's that's a great honor coming from you. Till next time.